How we doing? It's good to see you all. Man, I needed to sing that song this morning, Christ Be Magnified. I hope you, uh, I'm going to preach a whole sermon on it, but uh, I have a different one for today. Um, so uh, we're going to continue on in our worship as we look at God's Word. Before we do, will you pray with me? Let's pray. Father, we honor your presence here with us. We want nothing more than for you to be magnified in our midst. Let us magnify you how we take seriously your word. Let us magnify you with our lives and how we obey. God, we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, if, uh, if you're new, we're, uh, we've been going through the book of Acts. We've made it all the way to chapter 14. We're going to be looking at um, a portion of that chapter this morning. And in it, we're going to see four different things that occur in the 14th chapter of the book of Acts. We're going to see a message, a miracle, a mess, and some ministry. But before we get to the message, I need to begin with one question. And I need a, a show of hands if this uh, fits you, uh, this description fits you. How many people in here fall asleep during movies? Anybody? Okay, not as many. Uh, that's kind of uh, surprising. Maybe people at the nine responded more, you know, they're up earlier, so they fall asleep earlier. I don't know. I'll have to go think about that. I am a guy who falls asleep during movies. I, I had like almost an 11 in a row streak in the movie theater of falling asleep at movies. You know, it's dark. I usually have a kid nearby that's kind of like a space heater. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I'll pay 15 bucks for a nap, you know, uh, get them where I, can, uh, where I can find them. But th- that's me, you know. Um, do you remember those baby dolls that uh, if you tip them far enough this way, their eyes automatically close? That's me. I'm like a live version of that. You tip me far enough horizontal, I'm asleep. But if you're somebody who falls asleep during a movie, like I do, and then you wake up in the middle, but you kind of feel energized and you're interested, what's the question you ask when you wake up? What I miss, right? And the person who was awake loves to get that question, right? <laughs> They want to press pause and just, you know, that's, you didn't need to watch it. I'll summarize, right? No, people hate getting that question. I bring it up because we are in chapter, let me remind you, 14 of the book of Acts. We've been in this book for a number of months. Sometimes reading a book like this is like falling asleep periodically in between uh, movie scenes, right? And you might feel like you miss stuff. Or you come to church the next week and you're like, wait, how exactly did we get to now? So what I'd like to do as we begin is just offer a brief summary of how we got to now. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to summarize the entire book of Acts. But I'd like to start just back with one key event because it will make sense of one of the main characters and what we'll find today, the guy named Paul. You remember Paul? He used to go by the name. You guys are nailing this. This is amazing, right? And he used to be anti-Christian. He was a zealous Jew, and he thought the best way to live out his zeal was to fight against Christianity. He thought it was a competing claim against the truth about what God was really like. And so we see that in chapter 7 of eight, seven and 8 of the book of Acts, he actually oversaw the stoning of Stephen, the killing of a Christian, because just because he was a Christian. But then when Paul was on a journey, at that time he was Saul, on the way to Damascus, God saved him. Jesus appeared and uh, shone as a great light in the middle of the day and called out from heaven, why do you persecute me? And Saul was saved. We had a a Christian named Ananias go and heal Paul and restore his sight. And then Saul got off the sidelines and into the action. He immediately started preaching Jesus Christ as Lord. And he faced opposition in a couple different ways. One, now the guy who was literally killing people because of that message was giving it. And so he became the object of many people's hatred. But not only that, you have to imagine what it would have been like to be an early Christian and to see this guy who once hated your guts and wanted to kill you. Now he was supposedly on your team. And so Paul also faced some opposition from the team, the Christianity team he was trying to join. And people were wary of him because he had showed such opposition to their cause. And so Paul goes to Tarsus and he kind of lays low for a while. Now during that time, we, you might remember a few weeks ago, we preached on Peter having a vision, right? It was from that, um, uh, he, he had this sheet spread out and there were clean and unclean animals. And what does God say? God says, get up, Peter, kill and eat. My seven-year-old Micah will now sneak up to me in the kitchen and he'll say, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Because he, he loves that verse now. So <laughs> it's exactly what a seven-year-old would, would stick out in a sermon. But through that message of these clean and unclean animals, this thing that Jews prided themselves on would not eat unclean animals. 
Peter, in this vision, interprets it correctly and says, this means that the gospel is not just for the clean kinds of people, the good kinds of people. Therefore, the gospel is for everybody. And so Peter begins to, in that first man, Cornelius, this Roman centurion, spreads the gospel to the Gentiles. And so there's this movement afoot. The gospel is spreading. There's some success and some opposition. The gospel is now fair game for the Gentiles as well. It wasn't just for Jews. It was anybody who would call on the name of Jesus and trust in him for salvation. So a man named Barnabas that we met way back in chapter 4 um, goes and gets Saul and brings him to Antioch, that place where they were first called Christians. And the leadership there gets this kind of call from God. The Holy Spirit impresses upon them to lay hands on Barnabas and Paul and to send them out on what we now know as the first missionary journey. This first one was about 1,400 miles and it was around some of these coastal cities that we'll find Paul in today. And so, as we start the story, we find Paul and Barnabas in the middle of this first missionary journey in which they are preaching the gospel both to Jew and Gentile, and they end up in Iconium. We'll pick up the story, chapter 14, verse 1. It reads like this. At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Greeks believed. Now, the city Iconium, I wouldn't expect you to know where it is, but it is in an area you might know. It's in an area called Galatia. So Paul, later on, would write the letter to the Galatians to clarify some of the doctrine and theology and how to be Christians in that day and age. So if you wanted to know what were some of the things that Paul wanted Galatia to know, or in this case, Iconium to know, go read Galatians and you'll see, you'll get a feel of the message that Paul wanted to give them. And so we learn right away, it says that they went into the Jewish synagogue as usual. They had this method. They had come to preach the gospel to both Jew and Gentile, but for whatever reason, they thought it was a great place to start in the Jewish synagogue. And we see that they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Greeks believed. Now, again, it can just read like another sentence in the Bible, but to have this alignment, to have this unity between Jews and and Greeks is noteworthy. We see right away that the gospel has this unifying effect, that all of those cultural barriers could be leveled in the power of the gospel, that everybody enters into it as a needy sinner seeking salvation unto God, and they receive it through Jesus, whether you are Jew or Gentile. And so they have this message that they are preaching that brings unity. But it doesn't just bring unity. Verse 2. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the other Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. Now we immediately see, and you can probably guess, that this wasn't just universally accepted. There were people who refused to believe. Now there's something kind of hidden by that phrase that I think is significant. That, tr- that phrase, refuse to believe, can just as accurately be translated as disobedience. I think Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, that is recounting these events, wants us to know that the God that was preached in that time was not just a nice addition to your life. To disbelieve was to disobey. Now, that was very different than how religion was experienced in that culture. In that culture, in the Greek pantheon of gods, there were a zillion gods. Every area actually had local deities that you would pay homage to. And to disbelieve And a certain number of gods in that time was not disobedience. It might have just been seen as a disadvantage. It didn't raise to the level of, hey, if you don't believe, you're not inside the salvation of God. They would say, if you don't believe in these certain local deities, you may have bad luck. Or you may have less rain. Or you may have fewer crops. But it wasn't to the level of disobedience. It was mere disadvantage. So for Luke, as he writes this, to use this phrase that they disobeyed the disobedient Jews. What he is saying is the God that is about to be preached in this area is indeed the God of heaven and earth. He's the God of all creation. He created everything and therefore he has claim on everyone. So to disbelieve in him is not just to put you at a disadvantage. It's to put you in disobedience toward God. This is incredible. You can get a sense that the message 
that they were committed to was so powerful. Time and time again, we've seen this, that just because of what they said got them in trouble. They were thrown in prison or stoned or hurt or driven out of the city, all because of these words that left their mouths. The gospel, this message they were committed to in the early church was powerful. It pushed people towards some response. We noticed this at my small group on Friday night. It was like, hey, every time these guys show up and just say some stuff, people lose their minds, right? Sometimes we'll see in a moment they want to worship the people that bring the message. They see them as just messengers of the great Savior. But we also see that the message is so controversial that sometimes they want to kill them because of what they've said. So the message, this message they've committed themselves to is incredibly, incredibly important. And it makes, it's a message about a distinct God, the God of heaven and earth, who loved people enough to send a son and die for them. And so we see they have success and they have opposition. And as they experience some success and they face this fierce opposition, they're having their minds poisoned against them. What's the most logical thing to do when you're in a new place and you don't know a lot of people and you face opposition? Well, we read in verse 3, they did the sensible thing. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there, speaking boldly for the Lord, who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to perform signs and wonders. Dude, you have to love these guys and admire their courage. Most people leave a party early if they don't know enough people, right? These guys are going into a town that they don't know anybody with people that hate them, and they say, you know what would be the great thing to do? Let me spend considerable time here. They knew that this gospel was so valuable and so important, and they felt so responsible to spread it, that even in a place where minds were being poisoned against them, you can almost hear the words, don't be surprised if the world hates you. Don't be surprised if you are persecuted for my name's sake. They are living that firsthand, and yet they dig their heels in and they stay. They're actually practicing what they're preaching. The Bible says that they're preaching a message of his grace. And in grace, they stay in spite of opposition. It certainly wouldn't feel like grace if at the first pushback against the message, they said, okay, I see you don't want it, I'm out, right? Or I guess you don't deserve this message. No. They dig their heels in and they spend considerable time there trying to get this message of grace across in both word and deed. But things heat up enough that they eventually need to part ways with this city. Verse 4. The people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews, others with the apostles. There was a plot afoot among both Gentiles and Jews, together with their leaders, to mistreat them and stone them. But they found out about it and fled to the Lyconian cities of Lystra and Derbe in the surrounding country, where they continued to preach the gospel. So though things got too hot there and they needed to abandon their efforts in the city, but they didn't abandon the message. They preached the gospel wherever they went, even probably knowing that they would face opposition there. We've seen the message. Now let's see that sometimes when they preached, God blessed them with a miracle. Verse 8. It says, In Lystra there uh, there sat a man who was lame. He had been that way from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking, and Paul looked directly at him saw that he had faith to be healed and called out, stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. The story tells it well. Paul's in this new town and he goes to preach and he comes across a man who was lame, had never walked. This story may feel familiar. Jesus, I think it was in Mark 2, came across a man who had never walked and said, take up, uh, stand up, take your mat and walk. You might remember back in Acts 3 or you could go read it where Peter heals a man who was born lame outside the temple. And in that moment, it elicited this strong reaction because everybody outside the temple, as Peter healed and brought the message of Jesus as the Savior, was reminded of Isaiah 35, 6, when it said, the lame shall leap like a deer. They saw the prophecies of the long-awaited Messiah and Savior taking place, and not only what they said, but by what they did. And here Paul has the chance to heal a man. And what does it say? It says he saw that he had faith to be healed and the man stood up and was healed. God would often in these early days bless people with miracles. And I'm about to say something. I want you to hear me clearly. 
I am not about to just rule out the miraculous. I firmly believe God can do anything he wants. I believe God heals today. But I want you to know that part of the miraculous nature of that early church, yes, was healings, but was also how they lived day in and day out. I want to just go down the list of what the early church was known for in the book of Acts. Acts 2, verses 42 to 47. You want a picture of what the early church looked like? You can go there. And I want you to keep track of the miraculous things that I say. This early church was known for their devotion to the apostles' teaching. They were known for their fellowship, for the breaking of bread. They were known for prayer. Yes, they were known for many wonders performed by the apostles. They were known for their uh, commonality, that they were all together. They were known because they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. They were known because they met together in the temple courts. They were known because they broke bread in homes together and they practiced gladness and sincerity in their hearts. And they're known because they praised God and enjoyed the favor of all the people. Now, I just read a long list of defining features of the early church. And to my count, only one had to do with the miraculous. The reason why I say this, again, is not to rule out the miraculous. It's to rule in what your life hopefully looks like day in and day out and to breathe encouragement into you that it is making a difference. A few weeks ago, Joel told us, admonished us, I'd even say, that the world is watching how we live. And the early church knew that. And they lived out the gospel and spread it through word and in deed. It may feel miraculous that they loved each other so well that they would sell things to cover the needs of other people. But it's not miraculous. It's faithfulness. It's obedience. And yes, every once in a while, God would light them up with a miracle that only could be explained by him. But gosh, when you think about it, it certainly feels like a community that, like that would be known, would be appealing, would have this gravitational pull towards it. Most of what they were up to in those early days were preaching the gospel and living faithfully. You might remember in Acts 6, they picked seven people to do what? To make sure that widows had food. There was an insanely practical reality to living out the gospel, and it didn't always have to do with the miraculous. And they did it in word and deed. And the word was Christ died for sinners. And the deeds were we died to ourselves so we can love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Now, I need to say one more thing about this passage. See, it says in here, in verse 9, that Paul looked at him, saw he had faith to be healed, and he was healed. Some would take this verse and say, So you get healed if you have enough faith. So if you find yourself unwell or sick, it must be because you don't have enough faith. So really, you only have yourself to blame. If you find yourself unwell or sick, just womp up more faith and you'll be healed. uh, healed. And if you heal that, (laughs) gosh, man, heal in here. I got to get those letters straight, right? If you hear that message, run the other way. It's false. It's a lie. When Jesus was asked, why a man was blind. All of the assumptions were surrounding that man's lack of faith, that man's sin. Maybe it was his parents' sin and lack of faith, or maybe it was his own, but that's why he must be born blind, because of some deficiency. And you know what Jesus said in response? It's neither of those things. It's so that the glory of God and the power of God may be revealed in him. Faith is not a work. Paul, our main character in this story today, would go on to write this. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Even your faith is a gift. And as you suffer, you get to share in what it is to know all of the life of Christ. When Jesus talked about eternal life. Do you know how he described it? He said eternal life isn't always being well. He didn't say eternal life is always have things in your life look up and to the right. He said eternal life is knowing God and the one he sent, Jesus Christ. And when Paul would write about that, he would say, I want to know you, yes, in your power and in your resurrection, but I want to know you in your sufferings and your crucifixion as well. To know Christ, to know him, both the highs and and the lows. Jesus, when he was about to face suffering, said, let this cup be taken from me. But he didn't stop there. He said, but not my will, but thine be done. Do you know how fortunate we are that God the Father 
in his infinite wisdom and mercy, allow Jesus to suffer and hold on to that cup and not give it back until it had been drunk down to its bottom. Because somebody had to drink it. And it was either him or us. And thanks be to God. He allowed Jesus to suffer for you and for me. So if you are suffering today and sick, it is not on you to just womp up more faith so that you can get well. And if somebody tells you that, they don't know the gospel. (laughs) But pray for faith. Yes, pray for healing. But pray that you suffer in such a way that allows you to know the life of Christ, which is itself eternal life. So, we've seen a message that the early apostles committed themselves to. We've seen this miracle that happened in the way that they ministered. And now we see that it made a giant mess. Verse 11. It says, when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes because of the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. Now, I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but you know, we've all been there where you minister so well that you're confused as a god, right? They minister so well and they do this miracle and they think these are the gods that have come down. He says that the gods have come down to us in human form. This was something that they had longed for and something they had, they had wanted. And I don't know, it's actually never happened to me, but man, it might be nice to be so effective in your ministry that you thought, oh gosh, I'm mistaking this guy for the real thing. But Paul and Barnabas always want to deflect the glory from anything they do back to God. So what do they do? In verse 14 it says, but when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul heard of this, they tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd shouting, friends, why are you doing this? We too are only human like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless idols to the living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. They deflect the glory back and they do it in a very typically Jewish way. Every time that you would hear blasphemy against God, you would need to tear your clothes. And in that kind of attention-grabbing moment, you had a chance to clarify the misunderstanding. And here, they're being confused as gods themselves, which would have made sense in that time. See, he's switching his ministry. When he would preach to a Jewish crowd, they would have known the Bible, known that God is one. When you preach to a pagan Gentile crowd, they would have thought that the gods are many. So it wouldn't have been that big a deal to have these gods show up as, you know, more than just one God. But Paul and Barnabas are trying to preach the gospel to these Gentile people. And they say, no, 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 no. There is just one God and we are certainly not them. And they say, we bring you good news And you got to love the gospel because it's good news, bad news, right? The bad news is that thing that you've been investing your entire life in, these idols, are vain, worthless, dead. They demand everything and they give nothing because they're not real. But the good news is that we proclaim to you the living God, the God of all heavens and earth, the one God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. See, Paul knows his audience. He knows their cultural assumption. He knows their points of longings and desire and their points of pain. They wanted so badly for the gods to show up, but they kind of had given up hope. But in these men, they thought maybe, maybe, just maybe, the gods do actually care. And Paul was there to say, you're right that God cares, but it's not these worthless idols. It's the living Lord, Jesus Christ, who sits and reigns with the Father in heaven. And so Paul goes on to describe that God. Verse 16, he says, In the past, he let all the nations go their own way. He, yet he has not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. Even these words, even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. See, what Paul is actually saying is God is doing something new. In the past, God really let the leash out. There was this long period of several hundred years where God wasn't showing up and speaking through prophets. And everybody had kind of thought God left the building. And it it takes a little explaining, but through the influence of a guy named Plato, maybe you've heard of him, everybody kind of thought there was no real chance of the gods showing up ever again. But when you have experiences like this and you see the power of God on display in the lives of Christians, you think maybe, just maybe, God does care. Maybe, just maybe, God will show up. And Paul says, you know, God is doing something new. He used to let the leash out a long way and let you kind of go your own way. But now he's on the offensive. 
right? Everything from the incarnation to how he sent out the disciples is God saying, I'm doing something new. I'm getting involved. And it's go time. The offense is on the field. In the incarnation, God says, I'm not going to stay afar anymore. I'm coming to earth in human form. Right about when he goes to leave and he gives his great commission, he says, therefore, go, be on the offensive and make disciples of all nations. When the book of Acts starts, he says, you will be my witnesses here and everywhere. You just hear him saying, go, go. Even when he says, I have to go back to heaven and sit and reign with the Father, I'm not really leaving because I'm sending the Holy Spirit who will not just be near you, he'll be in you and empower you to spread this gospel. The offense is on the field and it's you. My plan to spread the gospel is you and I will give you everything you need. That's the shape of Christian ministry is being on the offensive. But if you're anything like me sometimes, have you ever felt on the defensive? Have you ever really felt scared to get out there with the gospel? Have you ever sat back and just worried about what question they might ask you when you present the gospel and how you might answer it? Do you ever worry about, oh my gosh, some of those Christians, they just don't represent Christ well? Or are you just waiting for the next church leader to do something stupid and disqualify themselves from ministry? Sometimes we get scared out of offense and into defense. And we sit back and assume that God's got it He doesn't really need us. I'm not that confident about it anyways. Somebody else will probably do it. Friends, (laughs) that is not the shape of the early church. They were on the offensive. These guys were out there going to cities that they weren't familiar with, with people they didn't know, and spreading the good news of the gospel. They felt such enormous responsibility that they said, it's got to be me. They took responsibility that they were God's plan. I hope you never feel defensive as a Christian, but you feel the power that they felt to be on the offense. You have the greatest story that's ever been told, and it's true. And you get to offer it to a dying and hurting world that needs to know the power and love of God. Well, what happened to them? Verse 19, then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. Then they stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back to the city. The next day, he and Barnabas left for Derby. They preached the gospel in that city and won a large number of disciples. You got to love it. Paul always doing the most sensible thing. He gets stoned, left for dead. He's not dead. He's back up and he's going right back into the city, right? He said, you must have really got hit hard on the head. You got to turn the other way, dude. And he's going right back in, back into the crosshairs because he believed so deeply that the gospel needed to come from people like him. The tables have completely turned. Paul used to stone people, now he's being stoned. But he takes it willingly. This is exactly the kind of stuff that Paul was doing before his conversion. And having been thought dead, he's dragged outside the city just like all unclean things that were dead were. But he charges back in, alive and well, still wanting to minister with the gospel. We've seen the message that they are committed to everywhere they go. We've seen the miracle that God can show up and do powerful things. We've seen this mess that can be made when you do ministry well. But lastly, we've seen that they are committed to ministering to the people of God. Verse 21, then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Paul and Barnabas are now backtracking through cities that they were kicked out of. You got to love these guys, right? (laughs) They don't take no for an answer. They'd be great at like uh, selling insurance or something like that, I think, right? They go back through and what do they want to do? They want to minister. They want to strengthen the disciples. They want and encourage them to remain true to the faith. And they want to warn them, caution them, encourage them and say, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. And now the last verse that we'll look at this morning, it says this in verse 23. Paul and Barnabas then appointed elders for them in each church and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. As they are finished ministering, they raise up leadership indigenous to each place so that they could be uh, uh, self-governing and autonomous. And they did that so with prayer and fasting. And they committed themselves to the Lord, in whom they had put their trust. And they know what happens next? They leave. Fourteen and a half years ago, Katie and I were in a hospital waiting for our daughter, Celia Rose Jackley, to be born. 
And after uh, Katie did all the heavy lifting and the baby was born, we spent a grand total of about 36 hours in the hospital. And then they said, you're ready, go ahead. You're out of here. To which I said, which one of you is coming home with us? I don't feel ready. It's too much responsibility. Are you putting that much trust in me? Katie, I get it. She's a natural. But me, I wanted to be a dad my whole life. This is the thing I was waiting for. And now I feel a little scared, a little nervous that the responsibility lied on me. 36 hours in the hospital. And then they send you home with this precious life that you're responsible for. And they're like, you'll be fine. It's a big gamble, right? But it worked. We figured it out. It's exactly the shape of the early church. They're in these places and they preach the gospel and people, hours after being saved, they said, I think you got everything you need. We're going to go on to the next city. Stay firm in the faith. Stand strong. Tell other people about it. The offense is on the field. You're God's plan A. You'll be fine. We got to go to the next place. Do you feel that? You know what I feel in that scene? Is that Paul has trust in God in you. Of course Paul has trust in God. But Paul has trust in God in you. He says you have everything you need. You have the power of the Holy Spirit. You have the gospel message that the world needs. It will meet the deepest longings of the human heart. What did these people really want? What did they say? What did they think happened? The gods have come down in human form. And Paul, smart guy as he is, I can imagine him saying this, you're half right, but there's just no S on the end of God. God has come down in human form. He came down in the person and power and presence of Jesus Christ. He saw you in your sin, and he's not like this vain, worthless, dead idol. He's alive and active and for you. He doesn't ask for anything. He just gives. He is the humble, suffering servant. He had come to see you in your sin and save you from it. And he gives you the faith you need to follow him. That's all you need to know. Now you're on offense. Now you're plan A. We have to move on to the next city. Paul has trust in God in you. Do you have trust in God in you? Do you feel like I am God's plan A? I have the message the world needs to hear. It will heal broken and hurting hearts. You don't need to be scared. You have the most powerful tool in the world. And the gospel answers the deepest longings of the human heart. You want forgiveness? Jesus gives it. You want community? Jesus provides it. You want meaning, peace, identity, freedom, hope, purpose. It is found in the gospel. Do you know how many of your friends and family and neighbors want that? And do you know who it's on to tell them? You. It's on you. But you don't go on there, out there alone. God didn't leave the building. He lives in your heart if you trust in him. It's not just a nice thing to say. It's the power of God in your life. You are God's plan A to spread the gospel. Paul had trust in God in you. Do you trust God in you? I think if you do, you'll get out there. You'll be on offense. And you'll offer the gospel, and you'll see people saved. Don't we all want that? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we give you great thanks. We thank you that you call us to extraordinary lives. You call us off the bench and into the game and on offense. Lord, when you drafted up the plan, we're kind of incredulous that it would end with us and your power in us, but that's what you decided was best. So God, we pray that we'd see the example of these early disciples and that we would commit ourselves to the message of the gospel. That we would trust in you to provide the miracle that we need to see people come to faith. That we freely admit that as we do this, that we might make a mess, but it can be cleaned up because you enable people like us to do ministry, to circle back to places, to strengthen, to encourage to say you'll go through hard times, but to bless and pray for those people and say you have everything you need to make it to the end. God, you have trusted us with your presence. Let us trust ourselves with it. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.